Snorra Sturluson SNR Saint RTLSN, was an Icelandic historian, poet, and politician. He was elected twice as law speaker at the Icelandic Parliament, the Althing. He was the author of the Prose Edda or Younger Edda, which consists of Gifaginning, a narrative of Norse mythology, the Skalds Kopimal, a book of poetic language, and the Hatartal, a list of verse forms. He was also the author of the Heimskringla, a history of the Norwegian kings that begins with legendary material in Inglinga saga and moves through to early medieval Scandinavian history. For stylistic and methodological reasons, Snorra is often taken to be the author of Eagle's Saga. As a historian and a mythographer, Snorra is remarkable for proposing the hypothesis that mythological gods begin as human war leaders and kings whose funeral sites develop cults. As people call upon the dead war leader as they go to battle, or the dead king as they face tribal hardship, they begin to venerate the figure. Eventually, the king or warrior is remembered only as a god. He also proposed that as tribes defeat others, they explain their victory by proposing that their own gods were in battle with the gods of the others. Biography Early life Snorra Sturluson was born in Havammer into the wealthy and powerful Sturlungar family of the Icelandic Commonwealth, in 1179. His parents were Sturlith Orthason the elder of Havammer and his second wife Guthni Bodvars de Tyr. He had two older brothers, Thorth Sturluson and Sivert Sturluson, two sisters and many half-siblings. By a quirk of circumstance Snorra was raised from the age of three by John Loftson, a relative of the Norwegian royal family, in Oddi, Iceland. As Sturla was trying to settle a lawsuit with the priest and chieftain Paul Solverson, the latter's wife lunged suddenly at him with a knife, intending, she said, to make him like his one-eyed hero Odin, but bystanders deflected the blow to his cheek instead. The resulting settlement would have beggared Paul, but John Loftson intervened in the Alding to mitigate the judgment and, to compensate Sturla, offered to raise and educate Snorra. Snorra therefore received an excellent education and made connections that he might not otherwise have made. He attended the school of Seaman Frothy, grandfather of John Lofson, at Oddi, and never returned to his parents' home. His father died in 1183 and his mother as guardian soon wasted Snorri's share of the inheritance. John Lofson died in 1197. The two families then arranged a marriage in 1199 between Snorra and Herdish, the daughter of Bersiva Mundarsson. From her father, Snorra inherited an estate at Borgen of chieftainship. He soon acquired more property and chieftainships. Snorra and Herdish were together for four years at Borg. They had at least two children, Halbera and John. The marriage succumbed to Snorri's philandering, and in 1206, he settled in Raykolt as manager of an estate there, but without Herdish. He made significant improvements to the estate, including a hot outdoor bath. The bath and the buildings have been preserved to some extent. During the initial years at Raykolt he had several children by three different women. Guthrun Reigns de Tyr, Odni, and Theridor Hals de Tyr. National life Snorra quickly became known as a poet, but was also a successful lawyer. In 1215, he became law speaker of the Althing, the only public office of the Icelandic Commonwealth and a position of high respect. In the summer of 1218, he left the law speaker position and sailed to Norway, by royal invitation. There he became well acquainted with the teenaged King Haken Hakonason and his co-regent, Jarl Scully. He spent the winter as houseguest of the Jarl. They showered gifts upon him, including the ship in which he sailed, and he in return wrote poetry about them. In the summer of 1219 he met his Swedish colleague, the law speaker Eskel Magnusson, and his wife, Christina Nils de Ter Blake, in Skara. They were both related to royalty and probably gave Snorra an insight into the history of Sweden. Snorra was mainly interested in history and culture. The Norwegian regents, however, cultivated Snorra, made him a Skutels vein, a senior title roughly equivalent to knight, and received an oath of loyalty. 
The king hoped to extend his realm to Iceland, which he could do by a resolution of the Althing, of which Snorra had been a key member. In 1220, Snorra returned to Iceland and by 1222 was back as law speaker of the Althing, which he held this time until 1232. The basis of his election was entirely his fame as a poet. Politically he was the king's spokesman, supporting union with Norway, a platform that acquired him enemies among the chiefs. In 1224, Snorra married Halvai Gormsdottir, a granddaughter of John Lothson, now a widow of great means with two young sons and made a contract of joint property ownership with her. Their children did not survive to adulthood, but Halvag's sons and seven of Snorri's children did live to adulthood. Snorra was the most powerful chieftain in Iceland during the years 1224 to 1230. Failure in Iceland Many of the other chiefs found his position as royal office holder contrary to their interests, especially the other Sturlungar. Snorri's strategy was to consolidate power over them, at which point he could offer Iceland to the king. His first move were civic. On the death in 1222 of Seemunda, son of John Loftson, he became a suitor for the hand of his daughter, so Olveig, heard a silent vote did nothing for his suit. His nephew, Sturla Sivertsen, Snorri's political opponent, stepped in to marry her in 1223, the year before Snorra met Halvig. A period of clan feuding followed. Snorra perceived that only resolute, saga-like actions could achieve his objective, but he proved unwilling or incapable of carrying them out. He raised an armed party under another nephew, Bodvarth Orthason, and another under his son, Orarekia, with the intent of executing a first strike against his brother Sivachur and Sturla Sivertsen. On the eve of battle he dismissed those forces and offered terms to his brother. Sivachur and Sturla with a force of 1,000 men drove Snorra into the countryside, where he sought refuge among the other chiefs. Orarakur undertook guerrilla operations in the fjords of western Iceland and the war was on. Harkon IV made an effort to intervene from afar, inviting all the chiefs of Iceland to a peace conference in Norway. This maneuver was transparent to Sivachur, who understood, as apparently Snorra did not, what could happen to the chiefs in Norway. Instead of killing his opponents, he began to insist that they take the king up on his offer. This was Orarekia's fate, who was captured by Sturla during an ostensible peace negotiation at Reykjaholt, and also at Thorli for Thorthason, a cousin of Snorri's, who came to his assistance with 800 men and was deserted by Snorra on the battlefield in a flare-up over the chain of command. In 1237, Snorra thought it best to join the king. The end of Snorra and the Commonwealth The reign of Harkon IV, king of Norway, was troubled by civil war relating to questions of succession and was at various times divided into quasi-independent regions under contenders. There were always plots against the king and questions of loyalty. Nevertheless, he managed to build up the Norwegian state from what it had been. When Snorra arrived in Norway for the second time it was clear to the king that he was no longer a reliable agent. The conflict between Harkin and Scully was beginning to escalate into civil war. Snorra stayed with the Jarl and his son, and the Jarl made him a Jarl hoping to command his allegiance. In August 1238, Sigvert and four of his sons were killed at the Battle of Orligstathir in Iceland against Gish Thorvaldsson and Kolbein the Young, chiefs whom they had provoked. Snorra, Orarek, and Thorlifer requested permission to return home. As the king now could not predict Snorri's behavior, permission was denied. He was explicitly ordered to remain in Norway on the basis of his honorary rank. Scully on the other hand gave permission and helped them book passage. Snorra must have had his own ideas about the king's position and the validity of his orders. But at any rate he chose to disobey them. His words according to Sturlunga saga, at Vilek, have become proverbial in Icelandic. He returned to Iceland in 1239. The king was distracted by the necessity to confront Scully, who declared himself king in 1239. 
He was defeated militarily and killed in 1240. Meanwhile, Snorra resumed his chieftainship and made a bid to crush Gish by prosecuting him in court for the deaths of Sigvert and Sterla. A meeting of the Alding was arranged for the summer of 1241 but Gish and Kolbein arrived with several hundred men. Snorra and 120 men formed around a church. Gish chose to pay fines rather than to attack. Meanwhile, in 1240, after the Jarl's defeat, but before his removal from the scene, Harkon sent two agents to Gish bearing a secret letter with orders to kill or capture Snorra. Gish was being invited now to join the Unionist movement, which he could accept or refuse, just as he pleased. His initial bid to take Snorra at the Alding failed. Halvig died of natural causes. When the family bickered over the inheritance, Halvig's sons, Kling and Orm, asked assistance from their uncle Gish. Holding a meeting with them and Kolbein the younger, Gish brought out the letter. Orm refused. Shortly after, Snorra received a letter in cipher runes warning him of the plot, but he could not understand them. Gish led 70 men on a daring raid to his house, achieving complete surprise. Snorra Sturluson was assassinated in his house at Raykolt in autumn of 1241. It is not clear that he was ever given the chance to avail himself of the capture option. He fled to the cellar. There, Simon Nutt harassed Tarni the bitter to strike him. Then Snorra said, Eigi Skal Hogva, do not strike, Simon answered. Hogthu, you strike now, Snorra replied. Eigi Skal Hogva, do not strike, and these were his last words. This act was not popular in either Iceland or Norway. To diminish the odium the king insisted that if Snorra had submitted he would have been spared. The fact that he could make such an argument reveals how far his influence in Iceland had come. Harkon went on suborning the chiefs of Iceland. In 1262, the Alding ratified union with Norway and royal authority was instituted in Iceland. Each member swore an oath of personal loyalty to the king, a practice which continued as each new king came to the throne, until absolute and hereditary monarchy was formally accepted by the Icelanders in 1662. Legacy Perhaps Snorri's most enduring importance lies in the fact that without his writings, our possibilities for perceiving the views and thoughts of pagan North Europeans would be considerably more limited than they admittedly are. His writings provide information and indications concerning persons and events influencing the peoples inhabiting this region during periods of time, concerning which information is scarce. To an extent, the legacy of Snorra Sturluson also played a role in politics long after his death. His writings could be used in support of the claims of later Norwegian kings concerning the venerability and extent of their rule. Later, Heimskringla factored in establishing a national identity during the Norwegian national independence movement. Icelandic perception of Snorra in the 20th century and to date has been colored by the historical views adopted when they sought to sever their ties with Denmark any revision of which still has strong nationalistic sentiments to contend with. To serve such views, Snorra and other leading Icelanders of his time are sometimes judged with some presentism, on the basis of concepts that only came into vogue centuries later, such as state, independence, sovereignty, and nation. Memorials Snorrisgate, a street in the district of St. Hans Haugen in Oslo, was named in his honor during 1896. The statue of Snorster Lassen by Gustav Vujland was unveiled in Bergen, Norway during 1938. A statue of Snorra Sturluson, by Gustav Vujland, is located at Reykholt. The Norwegian government donated the statue to the Icelandic nation in 1947. The 700th anniversary of his death was recognized by the issue of a set of six Norwegian commemorative postage stamps during 1941. Each stamp featured illustrations from Heimskringla by Norwegian artist Harald Damsleth.
Snorra Stavicultural Research Center in Reykholt was established on September 6, 1988 with opening ceremonies attended by Vigdish Finn Bogadottir, President of Iceland and King Olav V of Norway.